All right. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Sam.gov Bids Live episode number 46 today, where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on Sam.gov for your small business. And guys, it is so good to be back for sure. According to my, my YouTube studio over here, it's telling me it's been 76 days and 11 hours since our last Sam.gov bids live episode. Um, today, we will be reviewing five small business solicitations that I've pulled up on Sam and that we will be jumping into in just a second. But if you are new here and you don't want to miss future Sam.gov bids live episodes, make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. Now, if you are live with us on right now, I want to hear from you. Let me know what state are you representing? Let's go ahead and get it going here in the chat. Where are you guys representing from? And as we get that going, I'm going to go ahead and give you a sneak peek of the bids that we do have pulled up for today. So bid number one we have is shredding services. Bid number two is ground maintenance services. Number three, we do have diagnostic radiology technician. Number four, fire alarm maintenance and repair. And number five, we have pest and weed control services for Defense Supply Center Richmond. So those are the five bids that we will be getting into today. I'll try to make it so that we have enough time to get through all of those, of course. And you guys are already blowing up the chat. We got O Dawson. We got uh, in real life. He says hello, hello, Iron Body Sensei. Uh, Ryan Robinson, hello, uh, out of Kentucky. Nice. Christine out of New York. Power Solutions, Texas. Uh, Lloyd Jr., North Carolina. Good to see you. Good to see you. Iron Body out of Tennessee. We got Sheree L out of California. Uh, Shoe on the Block, Illinois. Awesome, guys. We're all over the place. Rachel Covington out of Virginia. Wise Guy, California. Keisha, I watch you all the time. This is my first live. Welcome, Keisha, for catching us on the live. One of our first lives back in, uh, like I said, 76 days and 11 hours, according to my YouTube studio. Wesley Peters, what's going on? First time from Texas. Good to have you here hanging out with us. We got Boss Big uh, Bino out of uh, Vegas. What's going on? Dustin from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Amazing. We have Mavis Simba hanging out with us on LinkedIn as well. Nice to see you from Dallas, Texas. Country Notary, as always, good to see you returning uh, community member from Texas. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and representing. Like, oh my gosh, like we got Christian from Connecticut, um, MMIMS from uh, from Georgia. So much, uh, so many of you, like all over the country, guys. Like, do we have like, it looks like we have at least half of the states here. How incredible. Um, well, thank you for joining me. And like I said, it's been a minute and I'm so glad to be back. And I'll just take a minute. We don't normally do this, but I'll just take a minute to kind of give a bit of an update. Um, and then we'll go ahead and just jump right into the bids, into all the fun like we normally do. If you're a returning uh, community member, you you really know how it goes, right? Um, so yeah, I've kind of been uh, behind the scenes working on some stuff. And at the same time, I've also been kind of dealing with some, some life situations as well. So the first thing I'll, I'll share is I actually was sick multiple times over the summer, basically starting back from uh, the May, June timeframe. So I got sick and it lasted for a couple weeks. Um, and I've also done a lot of traveling this year and that's, I think, contributed to the sickness. Um, but then the second time I got sick was just about two months ago. And I don't know if I had the thing or not, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but it was a really, it was a really bad sickness. I had it for a month. Uh, my, which, which, which made it really hard to work. As you can imagine, um, I had a really bad fever, really bad body aches. I didn't have any breathing issues though. That's why I'm like unsure if, you know, it was the vid or not. Um, and I had never had it before, 
but my my fatigue and my energy levels were just the lowest they had ever been in my life and it was a very slow progression out of that and so after like usually you have like a one to two two week mental window where you kind of know when you're going to pull yourself out of it and this one it was different and it really kind of messed with me and it had me kind of thinking like I was going crazy, you know, and I've spoke with other people who have had a similar experience. So I don't know exactly what it was, um, but I did pull myself out of it. Um, you know, and I lost my taste as well, but that's, that happens a lot. But, um, you know, I did pull myself out of it. Um, and pretty much around that same time, my father-in-law passed. And so that kind of segued directly into another month because he's in another side of the, the, the country of traveling and supporting my partner. And so it's just kind of been a lot of life, like I said. And so it's, it made, it's made it hard to kind of be public facing, right? And, and to be kind of consistent. And when I do something, I'd rather just be all in on it or just not do it at all and just kind of take that space, right? And so that's kind of what I have been doing for various reasons. I've been taking that space um, and so then in addition to that, I have used that kind of sporadic time where I wasn't able to be as outwardly facing to work on some things inside of the business, to create some things to share with you all, which is what I'm, I'm really excited about. And, you know, life goes through peaks and valleys, ups and downs. And so I try to stay positive and, and forward moving about it, regardless of what's, you know, kind of being thrown our way. Right. Um, so. I've written a book and I've created a new version of our program. It, these are like big things and I'm kind of just, this, I'm, this isn't even the unveiling yet. So just those of you who are watching right now are, are hearing it, but these are things that I'm going to be pushing out over the next one to two months uh, by the end of the year, before the end of the year. Um, but I'm going to be really uh, advertising, pushing out, giving out our a book that I made. It's actually with a publisher um, it's called the legal middleman method and I'm so proud of it. You know, I've written like a little mini book in the past. I carried over my story from that, but this is all about legal middlemaning because I believe that is really kind of what our future focus is going to be here on the channel and within our community. Um, and so then I've created some other larger things to go around that, that I will be uh, speaking more to about and launching more in the future. And so everything's going to kind of pivot and shift to be more aligned with teaching everyone how to legally middleman contracts because you know over this past year of kind of watching and reflecting my increased vision and perception of the of what i have to give and what i'm seeing in the market of what everybody's wanting to do and needing help with is legal middlemaning it doesn't mean you can't self-perform work or even grow into self-performing which i will even talk about i do talk about in the book but as a place to get started as a new small business GovCon startup, um, there's just really a right way and a wrong way to do that. And there's also some industries that are great to do this in and some industries that are not. And so I compiled all that information to make it really easy for you to, to use. So I'm very excited to be coming out with that in the future. Again, if you're watching right now, you're kind of just hearing it. You don't have to necessarily tell anybody, but we're just creating a little bit of buzz right now. I will be turning the volume up on that over the next 30 to 60 days. So if you're paying attention, you will see that coming. So that's the that's the positive, the the, the creative stuff that's come out of a bit of the, the downtime. So hopefully that um, is ex exciting to you as it is to me. I think it's time we can go ahead and get more into get more into the show here. What's going on into the I, I should just take a second to check into the, the chat here, though. I see. I think I see some people talking about the vax. I'm not even going to get into that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Stress lowers your immune system. Definitely. De definitely. Um, you got to focus on yourself first. Absolutely. And I, I've learned a lot about that. And going forward too, that's a lot of managing myself better, stress and health. You know, health isn't just like going to the gym and eating right, but it is mental health and managing your stress. And I really learned that lesson this year. And moving forward, I'm reorganizing how I show up in the business to not only show up better 
for those who are interested in learning, but doing so in a way that's much more balanced. And so that when I come, I can really deliver. And then I'm not like doing things that are stealing my energy, if that makes sense. So I, I really appreciate it, guys. I appreciate uh, all of the well wishes and the thoughts there in the chat. I wish I could go through all of them, but I think it's better that we just jump into our bids for the sake of our first show back. But it is so good to be back and nice to see so many regulars and also so many new faces on as well. Bid number one, shredding services. And Papa Bear says, it's like we never missed a week. Um, and I'm starting my workout and running into government. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, number one, shredding services. So this is for the Army, NGB, National Guard. Updated due date is October 30th. So just a week away. Total small business, not a lot of time. Total small business set aside, 561-990, all, all other support services. And this is out of uh, Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming. In terms of attachments, we have a solicitation, we have some provisions, we have the statement of work, we have a wage determination, and we have Q&A, okay? Just like I always tell you, you can, you can, you can gauge, you can discern a good amount of information over time of what is going to be requested, what contracting is giving you in these solicitations by just reading the simple uh, naming conventions of the, the files that they've attached. Something to get better at over time. Christopher uh, Davalos and uh, Christopher uh, Kale, or Kali, in contracting. We do see that there's been a number of updates here starting. There was a source of salt October 4th. So they've quickly ramped up on this, right? October 4th of this year, source of salt. Then October 15th, right? Less than, uh, yeah, just, just a little over 10 days later, solicitation. And then 18th, there's an update. And then an update and then an update and those updates are likely those q a's that we saw posted let's just see what we have going on in our solicitation it's going to get our feet wet with the most kind of ballpark look of what we got so right off the gate here it's only four pages long there's some repeat information they're saying questions are due october 19th so that was already five days ago we do have pricing CLIN, so we see CLIN 1, and then we see uh, CLIN 1001, which also tells us it's an option year. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit more for you. There you go. Um, but it also says option year, so we know that. But uh, 1001, 2001, 3001, 4001. So base plus 4. And again, this is shredding services, right? Like It is like it sounds. But they're asking us to price it per month and then for a total annual. So this would be, you know, one twelfth, and this would be times twelve. Pretty, pretty straightforward. You see if there was any other important dates here, like a like a POP. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious because they're saying location of services to be provided. It's going to be at the actual NGB location. It appears for instruction to offers is just jumping right off the right off the paper here, it says the response shall consist of two separate parts, part one price, part two technical. Price is going to be what they just give us, gave us here, right? And then the technical vendor must be able to physically show the capability to destroy information to the standards that are located in the PWS and the facility where the destruction occurs. Um, let's see if their facility is more than 50 miles away you will be considered not technically acceptable. So they don't want it being transported more than 50 miles from the NGB location. Makes sense. However, the basis for award is LPTA. So they're basically saying like, hey, convince us. They're saying physically show your capability of how you're going to destroy this and then confirm to us that you're not going to destruct this more than 50 miles from the 153rd airlift wing. And then you will be found technically acceptable. You will make it to round two. Then we will look at your price for the lowest price evaluation. Does that make sense? So it's fairly straightforward on this. And one thing about shredding services, guys, is there, there's a lot of them. 
there is this is something we see that the government as a umbrella if you will is buying so different agencies are also buying the same service right so we have this statement of work here and then just a quick peek at the q a i think is going to be uh, justice for this one so see these are the locations that they were referencing so we do have a pop so this is important starting one september so this is due again we said uh october yeah october 30th so you would likely it's possible it's very possible this this pop sorry the base the pop gets pushed back start of contract to 30 august and they're saying start of contract here because because why why not just say one september they did it here why can't they do it here why because they know it's probably not going to be one september why because the due date is october 30th right so it might be a couple weeks into uh sorry i'm getting that mixed up i'm thinking november we're in october um it's going to be somewhere into november at the earliest that this gets kicked out and then for the option years it's going to pick back up one september okay but this is going to go through 30 august which is why so this will not be a full the base year it will not be a full it might be 10 months or 10 and a half months something like that but it won't be a full um if you if you wanted to you know 20 80 hours or this isn't a staffing contract but it wouldn't be a full manpower's year of work in this case in shredding services it would be maybe more like 10 10 and a half months but that's what we we're looking for with that pop and that's why it's going to be shaved off a little bit at the beginning just because the due date for the proposal and the start dates are so close together so that's actually very straightforward but i do want to take one sneak peek before moving on to the next bid and also checking in with what we've got going on with your questions in the chat so for questions here q and a uh, we've got almost three pages always go through q a guys and also anytime you're bidding on something always ask questions if you have them just looking to see if there's anything that we covered that's standing out or if this is more specific to the actual service which we don't need to cover you know lots going on with the actual size of the containers it looks like there's a lot of clarifications happening so if you were to bid on something like this definitely you want to make sure you review that well in advance what did i got to catch up here on in the chat shawnee says excited for the book let me switch modes here and happy you're a film writer. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. And I'm really excited to get the book pushed out. Um, I think it's really going to set us apart. It's like we never missed a week. That's right. We caught up on that. We've got MMIMS GovCon. We're glad you're back and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Boss saying thanks for sharing with us. And I totally agree. You got to watch the energy. A Christian says, on your first contract, I won a shredding services on your first contract, I want a shredding services for 263,000. Uh, Congratulations, Christian. I'm not sure if you're saying that you won that recently or if you're just saying that because we just covered a shredding contract as well. But it sounds like on your first contract, you won uh, just under uh, 300K. That's that's amazing for shredding services. Absolutely. John says, are we bidding vouchers? Um, I don't think so. I don't think that's any of the contracts. Uh, if so if the date has passed can we still respond absolutely not nope if the date has passed you cannot respond so this is the one we just covered was the 30th so it's about a week away at your last command we had um we had guys pull up and shred on base in a 16 wheeler absolutely yep i've i've actually uh seen that myself too they just pull up it's on site it's a mobile thing and they do it right there and then and they probably do a good amount of contracts and that's what I'm talking about, guys. If you do get into legal middlemanning, if it's something that you're using um, a teaming partner to work with, your subcontracting services and managing the contract, you can learn how to do this. Like you need to be involved in the contract at some form and fashion, irregardless, right? And then if you decide this is something that you want to do or can do or grow into to bring in house, because it's just going to make you more profitable to not have that middle link in there, right? But th this is a way to get started. 
but you can grow and grow in profitability. And like, you can invest in like this mobile facility or whatever. I've seen it happen many, many times because then that way you're growing from a proof of concept. You're not just like investing money, investing capital in this thing that you hope you win a contract on. It's something that over five years you can say, okay, you know what? It's going to be worth the investment. And then we're going to go after others. We're going to have direct past performance. And yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like that's way more of a business plan than like printing stuff off of USA spending and reading through forecasts and creating this perfect plan on paper. Like that's, this is like a real game plan. You know what I'm saying? Why are there contracts that are past due still showing up as active? Um, Cause they may not have pulled them off. Uh, it's, an, it's Eric, it's an administrative thing. They haven't been archived yet. And also just make sure that you're looking at um, this is because there's a difference between the original post date and the updated offers due date. So make sure that the updated offers due date is not something that's still in the future. But yeah, other than that, those things are they're out there. Solicitations float out there that shouldn't they should be archived. They should be taken off and they're not. And it's an, it's an administrative thing that just has not been updated. Shani says, I think I still get hung up on how to respond to the technical capability part of a solicitation. Really, it's just answering the specific questions. So like what we just covered in the first solicitation, they were looking for a physical proof, a physical demonstration showing them which IE is going to be look like for this. Like, like, what are your shredders? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is the capacity? What is the volume? How many? How many people? Like, that's the physical piece you could respond to. So look at responding to technical parts of a solicitation as not what are you going to do? Cause that would just be parroting back the statement of work and contracting doesn't, it's, it's actually not helpful in the evaluation, but how are you going to do the work? So whether you're responding to it or you're working with a teaming partner, subcontractor respond to technical pieces as answering questions. And it's, how are you going to complete the work? Now, if they give you the specific questions, Shawnee, which they often do, you just have to look for them and find them. So if you're saying I'm having a hard time with it, it also that also sounds like you're not finding what to respond to. Because once you find it, it's not hard. You just have to do it, right? Now, that's a different type of hard. But if you don't even know what you're trying to respond to, that's like impossible. So you have to find what it is, right? And then it, if, if it's not there, you have to also confirm that they're even asking for one, right? Because if they're asking for a technical, they should be telling you what they want. If you're not seeing that, make sure they're asking for a technical. Don't don't make the assumptions that they are. Maybe it's just price only. Maybe it's just price and past performance. So it's a bit nuanced, but I promise as you kind of go through this, you will see that it's only going to be so many. It's only going to be so many ways. I hope that makes sense. And also, when in doubt, um, ask contracting. Like clarify with them. There we go. If sources hot has expired, can we still respond? No. So for, for all the expiration questions, if it's respond, if, it, if it's expired, you cannot respond. It's just, it's done. Steven says, I've watched a ton of your videos, but I still can't comprehend how a prime contractor does at least 51% of the work on site that they've never stepped foot on. Can you explain? Um, 51% of the work, you're talking about those limitations on subcontracting. And you're also talking about when it comes to um, like socioeconomic set-asides. So woman-owned, 8A hub zone, but you're getting more into like legal middlemaning, right? You're talking about those percentages that you have to self-perform. You know, if it's small business set aside, you don't necessarily have to do that. If it's those socioeconomic categories, you know, it depends on simplified acquisition threshold, all those things come into play, right? And I'm, I'm not answering all of that right now. It's a much bigger explanation. But again, the question is, I still can't comprehend how a prime contractor does at least 51% of the work on site that they've never stepped foot on. So if you win a contract and you're required to do that, you have to do 51% of the work. There's not a question of how you, you have to do it, right? Otherwise, you're not going to be in compliance with the contract. If you find yourself in a situation, like I said, of winning a contract where you are in a socioeconomic category and you have to self-perform that, you how do you do it? You do it. Like you, you have to do it. Don't bid on contracts that you don't know how to do it then. Like that's that's how that's how you don't find yourself in the in the problem. Um if you find yourself in a situation, it's already too late. 
So don't bid on contracts where you have to perform 51% of the work and then win it and say, I don't know how to do this because I never did it before. So the problem isn't the way that you're posing it. The problem is actually in the situation you're finding yourself to be in. The way to solve this problem is to not get in that situation in the first place, which means if you're not able to do that, don't bid on, you know, for example, socioeconomic set aside contracts like woman owned 8A veteran owned hub zone that are going to require you to do your minimum percentages, regardless if it's above or below simplified acquisition, right? So again, the short answer is oh, don't get yourself into that situation to begin with. Um, and then if you're not in a situation and you're doing a legal middleman where subcontractors are doing majority of the work or all of the work, then it's, then it's not a problem, right? So it seems like this question is coming from not having a firm understanding of uh, the regulations and how it works and how it applies. So I'd recommend studying legal middlemaning more. Um, I think that's going to be the best answer for you. Cool, guys. Let's go on to the next bid, um, and I'll do my best to stay on top of questions. But of course, um, I can't get to them all. Grounds Maintenance Services, Lewisburg, West Virginia. This is for the Army as well, ACC, uh, Army Contracting Command, New Jersey. Small business set aside. But so again, just for my last point, set aside, small business. It doesn't say 8A, it doesn't say hub zone, it doesn't say woman owned, it doesn't say um, veteran owned, right? Those are socioeconomic categories, right? Where you have to meet self-performance limits, okay? Total small business set aside is not a socioeconomic category where that pertains for self-performance limits, okay? The whole goal is, guys, I say it all the time. If the government's pumping money into, say, woman-owned small businesses and the woman-owned small business just takes a fee and then they just give it to somebody else to do, the woman-owned small business is not being elevated the way it's supposed to, right? So when in doubt, just check, is the money going where it's supposed to go? If it's not, then you're doing something that's that's not correct, right? 561730 Landscaping Services. And then for attachments, we have the wage determination, we have a map, we have a statement of work, and then we have a solicitation. We have Maurice Mims in uh, contracting, and we just have the original solicitation update here. So we'll go ahead and take a peek at our solicitation. And I know guys, like I can't explain, like legal middle manning is not explained in uh, 30 seconds. So just do more research, watch more videos, learn more about it. or get the book. <laughs> the book will explain it all and then some. I just don't have it yet. It's with the publisher. It's getting created right now. I just reviewed the book cover today. So it's coming out soon, but eventually I'll be able to say, get the book. It's super inexpensive. It's an inexpensive way to understand all of it. Um, but until then, we'll just say research. So we're hit with our pricing cleanse for, again, this grounds maintenance solicitation. We have CLIN 1. 18 quantity for mowing, CLIN 02, they have edging, three, we have trimming, four, we have spring and fall cleanup with just a quantity of two, so a couple times a year. And then we're gonna repeat for uh, an option year one, all those same services, option year two. Okay, so this is gonna be a base plus three, base plus four. Okay, so this is one of those five year contracts. Slight escalations over time would be a nice contract to have in your book of business for your GovCon services agency, guys. You know, I talk, you know, this is another thing that I, I build out more on in the, the new uh, information I'll be pushing out, but stack 10 of these contracts over a couple of years. And what's great is if you're only focusing on winning a few of these each year, but those option X, you know, if you're doing a good job, those option years are going to continue to be executed and those stack year after year after year until you've gone through maybe all four of your, your option years, right? So just focusing on a small number over a couple of years, you could be billing out for, you know, 10 plus contracts for work that you've done over the last couple of years. That's why I love and I'm so passionate about and have always been that way uh, with services types contracts because the work you do in one year if you do a good job, we'll more than likely carry over for all those option years as well. So we have our pricing cleanse. 
we do have our delivery schedule here, which is showing us uh, some nice clear POPs. So the work shall commence 16 November here. So what about three weeks away or so? So again, we may see this because it's cutting a little close because this is due on the second. So yeah, definitely cutting it close. So this could be pushed back for evaluation purposes, but it's gonna go until the same time uh, in the subsequent year for a base plus all those option year periods, okay? Pretty consistent with what we just covered, but nonetheless gives us all the confidence that we are uh, reading and seeing what we need to ensure we're understanding the, the contract the way that we need to. So we have our reps and certs. I'm now looking for proposal specific information, maybe instructions, offers, evaluation factors would be nice to, to tell me, for a contractor to tell me, okay, what do you need from me? What do I need to give you in my response? Is it just a price? I do see the pricing cleanse we just walked through there. Is there a proposal? Is there a technical? Do you need past performance? Do you need resumes? Do you need a staffing plan? Do you need a quality plan? Any of those things would be good to know. And lo and behold, we don't see it, right? And so much of what you guys experience and why we, we cover multiple bids and we do many episodes, today's episode number 46, to expose you to all the different variances. And like I said, nuances that you may experience because there is no one cookie cutter way to approach solicitations. Why? Because every bid is different. So if you learn to do it one way, what about the 99 other different ways? You're still going to not know how to do it. So repetition, volume, practice is the key so that you can understand what to do in these 99 other situations. Eventually, it starts to stack. Eventually, you get to be able to approach these and say, okay, I am confident in understanding this the way that I think it is. But it does take more repetitions than, than, than not because you're not just, again, learning one thing. You're learning, you're learning one thing like in a hundred different ways, okay? Different variations. And like I always say, when it comes to government forms, things like uh, like a SF-1449 form, for example, was a big one, or pricing sheets, or even a technical section, right? What is the rule when it comes to government forms? We do not go looking for them, okay? We fill out what is given to us. We Work with the information that contracting gives to us. You can't say, oh, I learned how to do SF 1449 form on a previous bid. Maybe something that Derek showed me. And now I'm not seeing it on my bid. I'm stuck. What do I do? Well, if you don't have it, you don't fill it out, right? If contracting needs you to fill something out. They give it to you. Now, if they're asking for it and they don't give it to you, then that's worthy of an RFI to say, hey, please provide, sir or ma'am, please provide. But they may just say, oh, that's a typo and then amend the contract, right? So we have our statement of work here, looks fairly standard. Not seeing any, here we got a map and a wage determination. Not seeing any technical jump out to us. Not seeing any instruction to offers or evaluation factors to tell us those answers to those questions I asked a minute ago about you know past performance or a technical response, et cetera, et cetera. I will do just to double check. I'm going to, yeah, I, I saw this. That was all that I saw. So are they giving us actually anything? So on page four, yeah, they're essentially telling us to fill out the reps and certs, they're giving us typical clauses for evaluation factors. We do have our SF-1449 form. So it's it's really quickly shaping up to be something that is price dominant, which we do see very often with ground maintenance type contracts. So that also checks out from a common sense type standpoint. So this information is going to be pre preliminary dominant. So if you're working with a subcontractor, for example, another small business, right? You're using a similarly situated entity approach, small business, a small business, this is set aside for small business. 100% of small businesses 
are performing this work, whether it's 100% a sub, 0% you, or somewhere in the middle, 100% of the work is being done by small businesses, as is set aside. So 100% of the money is going to where it's supposed to go. Everybody's happy, right? That's another look at legal middlemaning. So we know that that checks out. So I hope this makes sense. This is a very different solicitation than not very different, but somewhat different because it is a price only bid. Now, certainly all these, you want to spend more time, but using like control F control find is great just to kind of make sure you don't miss anything. I mean, I miss stuff all the time, but that's why you have these little tips and tricks to kind of quickly get you up to speed to make sure you didn't miss something. Justina says, I need help with solicitations that start with N. I don't really know what that means. Um, I would be curious what you mean by that. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Christian says, uh, question, do you think on the contract that I want, it's a good value? Um, the, the 263, yeah, it's a five years, I mentioned, with a value of 263. So with 110K profit over the five years, which is 22K per year. It sounds good to me. I don't know what your, I mean, I guess I could do the quick math problem to understand what your your costs and your expenses are if you're telling me your profit is 110, but that those numbers sound, if you're saying out of 263, your profit is 110, those, those numbers are very solid. Those numbers are very solid. Those margins are probably a bit higher than, than most. Steven says, I'm, like, uh, I'm confused. When I see testimonies of people winning, for example, janitorial contracts performed in a state they are not in and subbing out the work, I'm definitely missing something. Um, where does this, so you can do that, Stephen. It's just, it's every, every single contract is different. So it sounds like you're looking at it from, okay, I need to do 51% of the work. So based on what you, your previous statement, that's what it sounds like you're saying. That's not the case for every single contract. Every contract is different. There's different regulations that apply based on what's going on with different contracts, different contract set-asides, different contract dollar values. These things affect every single contract. So for that reason, you have to understand that information first so that you can apply it to every contract you're considering bidding on. You cannot just take a 51% self-performance and say, I'm going to do that for every contract, but I don't want to do any of the work which kind of sounds like, so it sounds like your, your current understanding of it is at a basic level because that applies on certain contracts, but not all of them. So I think there are some things that you're, you're missing um, because you're saying, well, I, I, heard, I saw this testimony or I saw this company do it, right? How did they do it? Well, they probably did it within the confines of two, two options. They did it within the confines of a way that they were able to do it or two, they just did it out of regulation and they're hoping that they don't get caught quite honestly. And a lot of people do it. I think a lot more people do it that way, unfortunately, hoping they don't get caught or maybe they don't know they're doing it out of compliance. Right. So if they do get caught, X, Y, Z can happen. You know what I'm saying? Um, you don't want to, I never talk about doing it that way um, on our channel. So we only talk about the way of doing it in compliance. So, there are instances where you can do what you're describing, but there's many instances where that doesn't apply to. So it does sound like um, you just need to beef up the knowledge and the understanding. And it's okay because a lot of people uh, have that question. And that, that's why I'm trying to teach it. Like that's why I wrote a book, right? So sit tight that more of that information is gonna be pushed out. It's gonna be a lot more robust, a lot more comprehensive because this is what motivates me. There's so many questions. And for those of you who are wanting to get into this and you are wanting to do it the right way, you don't want to be reckless about it, I really appreciate you, right? And it's not about me, but like the SBA, you know, the, the federal acquisition regulations, you know, they're here for a reason. Um, so this way you can do it a way that is in compliance where you don't have to, you know, lose sleep at night. How to avoid having a company bid on a contract that you bid on? I got a quote from a company and found out later they won the contract. So Demetrius is a good question. Um, the way that you do this is you make sure that company doesn't have a cage code. Right? 
subcontractors, teaming partners don't have to have cage codes to be a, like a subcontractor or a level one tier contractor on your contract. They don't have to have a cage code. The prime contractor has to have the cage code. So you as the prime, that's what you bring to the table. It's what, if you're doing legal middlemanning, it's the essential piece, right? Not only that, but you're going to be managing the contract. You're going to be running all communications with the core, with the contracting officer, right? You're going to be doing the invoicing. So you're going to be managing the payment flow. Like you have a lot of stuff you're going to be doing as the prime, right? This whole idea of set it and forget it is absolutely nonsense. Even if you have a sub that's performing the service, you have a lot of managerial stuff that, that you're going to be doing that's going to keep you very busy, okay? And then if you are doing some service on top of that, then that's just an addition, okay? But the way you avoid getting a quote and then that company going direct is making sure that they need you. So if they have the cage code, they don't need you. And then the other level deeper is if you're looking at a a set aside contract, if you are looking at socioeconomic uh, set asides, 8A woman owned hub zone, veteran owned, I think I've said it more in one <laughs> this one episode than I've had in any other episode. But the big four, right? If you're bidding on one of those big four, also make sure they don't have that, right? Because if you're certified woman owned and they're not, they need you. And then if you're legal middlemaning, you need them. Okay, so make sure it is a dynamic can't think of the, the the best word for it but make sure you're both adding value to the contract and that you both need each other right this happens when you're just getting quotes from anybody you're not having any sort of meaningful conversation we talk a lot about working with subs as well and then in the the new course and in the new book you know like sub scripts sub markups sub site visit checklist there's a lot that i put into that um, but do, doing the discovery call, the intro call, these are things that you should be flushing out with the sub to make sure they're going to be a good fit for you because you don't want to be desperate to just get a number because then you get burned. And I'm not saying that you were in that situation, but I am saying you're, you, this is a very avoidable situation if you just do a little bit of this upfront research. I hope that makes sense. Justina says, instead of SPE, it starts with an N for Navy. Okay, so you're saying you need help with Navy contracts. Um, without anything more specific, again, uh, I, you know, I what I will say is back onto what I was saying was, you know, a Navy contract versus an Air Force contract versus a, a VA contract. The solicitations will literally look and feel different. They will even be laid out differently. The core information, the stuff that we covered here on this channel and what I teach and train on remains consistent across all the federal agencies. Why am I so confident about that? Because I've gone through thousands of them for all the agencies. So I know those differences and I know the things that I teach and I train you on. You can, you could see, you could come across from any of these agencies. So if you are, if you understand this, you are prepared for any of those, right? Now, if there is nuances, which there is from agency to agency to agency, absolutely. There is not just one standardized process. I mean, there's the A through M that they're supposed to follow for solicitations, A, B, C, D, all the way to M, right? That's why instruction to offer is a section L, evaluations a section M. Those aren't just things that we say, they're actual technical parts of the, the layout that is supposed to follow, but it's not always followed that way. Right. So aside from that, it's about getting, again, it's getting those revolutions and those repetitions in and, and reading, extracting what applies to you, building an outline off of it, answering the questions that they ask, at, you know, asking questions to contracting where there's gaps and things that don't make sense, dialing in your pricing, right? Like that whole process is going to be the same for the Navy as it is going to be for the Army. So if there's little things that are throwing you off, um, I would say communicate with contracting initially on that if you don't know what it means or if you're not sure what's being asked of you because it's possible that others are having the same exact question as you. So it might be worthy as an RFI, you know. But then if it's something where it's just like, man, I'm just like stuck. I'm just surrounded and I'm stuck. 
I, I spin in a circle and I don't know what I'm doing with like many, many solicitations, then it's like, maybe you just need to beef up the skills a little bit. It might not be a contracting thing. It might just be like a skill improvement where you just need to get more practice with it. I'm not sure how helpful that is, but I'm trying to give you the real honest answer. All right, guys, let's go to the next solicitation here. And if you guys liking the episode, smash the like button. And if you're watching and you're not subscribed, consider subscribing to the channel. If you, you know, like the value that we put out into the, the, uh, the YouTube sphere. Our next bid is again for diagnostic radiology technician, Minneapolis. Hey, they're even giving us a POP right inside the title. Uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, 2024, for one year, it looks like. So radiology, tech, one year, VA, SDV, OSB set aside, consistent with, you know, the vet's first VA, you know, court case from maybe five, six years ago. 621-111, Offices of Physicians, NAICS Code, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Place of Performance. So we're thinking a person, we're thinking tech, we're thinking one year. This is SDVOSB. So in order to even respond to this, your company, the prime contractor, has to be SDVOSB set aside, which is now being done through the SBA, no longer through the VA. Just like they took over the WOSB cert as well. Um, and they already have the 8A cert, so I'm just not sure about the hub zone. But I think they're just, and maybe they do already have the hub zone, but I, I'm thinking the SBA is just going to be rightfully so um, integrating all four of those. So for attachments, we have a OCI, um, Organizational Conflict of Interest Security Checklist, Immigration, Nationality Act Requirement. We've got a QASP. Background checks, VA rules of behavior, and then a solicitation, and then maybe an amendment here. So this is a good example of, as we were just saying, like how solicitations can look different, look and feel different. I mean, this is a SF 1449 form, and it, I mean, it's the same as that form. It already looks a little bit more texty, a little bit more, uh, I guess you could say archaic. But they're telling us full-time equivalent. That's what FTE stands for, Diagnostic Radiology Tech for the Minneapolis VA healthcare system. So in terms of this, we know like this is a staffing contract. They need a person. And they need a person for one year. We are hit with a pricing table. They're saying base period is 12-1, right? So this may pose a question because they said what, April 1, remember April Fool's Day? They said 4-1 to 3-31, and here this says 12-0-1 to 11-30. Both appear to be a year, but very different periods of performance. So that would be worthy of an RFI. Maybe that's already been offered. So they're giving us 11,000 hours. which is interesting. So it appears to be aggregate of one, two, three, four, five positions. And they're saying 5.6 technologists here. So they want a price per hour. for what appears to be up to five positions. A little bit like, as you can see, that's that's a quite a swing from coming into this thinking of one, uh, one person. The contract proposes a minimum of 5.6 FTE technicians, right? Key personnel to be credentialed and available for this time period of 12-1, right? So we have some questions, but this is also really, really good information. It actually makes the, the contract that much more desirable as well. Um, Guaranteed minimum is dollar amounts is $2,000 or 
1.5 million. All right, so that doesn't really help us too much. But they're saying that's just for a base period as well. So we could expect, because this one's very different, right? But if you're into staffing, if you're into providing people, it's probably something you want to have some prior experience with. Just from the whole HR side of things, that's not GovCon specific, that's just business specific, right? So I do see some new GovCon startups struggle for that reason to get directly into staffing because you have to provide all of that for, uh, for a person, right? And you can absolutely do it. It's just sometimes it's a lot. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually fast forward to the bottom and work my way backwards. Let me know. Do any of you, we've got reps and certs here. Any of you guys like to read backwards? I actually always read backwards um, when it comes to contracts but I don't usually do it on the show because I don't want to confuse you guys. But when it comes to, you know, solicitations that are hundred pages or more, I like to back into things. So we are actually finding here more what I was looking for. Yeah. XO blue says sometimes, yeah, for me, it's kind of like a, an anxious type thing where it's like, I'm trying to hold on to stuff that I'm reading, but I'm not letting myself go into it until I find what I'm looking for. So this way I find what I'm looking for first. Then it lets me kind of process things much easier. So we do see evaluation factors instruction to offer should be before this, but this is also very telling about what they would be wanting in this response and IE the person. So as we could guess for the technical, they are looking for uh, qualifications, quals, uh, experience, then specifically collaboration skills, and then um, contract management and admin capability and responsibility. I'm seeing factor one with a sub factor for each of these as well. So sub factors A, B, C, and D. And then factor two, past performance and factor three, price. So this should mirror match the instruction to offer. So hopefully we see one, hopefully they have one. If not, it will be this but the instructions to offer should be a mirror of this. And for the person who had the question about the technical, like this is like, they're telling you specifically what they want. So if there is a technical, you should be able to like literally, if they have sub factors like they've given us here or specific questions, specific things they want you to respond to, you build an outline based off of that. You literally copy and paste that into a blank Word doc, you know, space it out, format it, whatever, you know, it's should be sloppy at this point and then start writing to each of these you know what i'm saying and then if they have more specific things start plugging that in then before you know it you take a step back you're 70 80 percent done with that part of it there shouldn't be guesswork when it comes to technical responses if there's guesswork you're either doing it wrong or they've given you nothing and then it shouldn't be guesswork you should be responding to the how are you going to do it which means it's not guesswork anymore so right now I'm looking for the instruction to offers to match that evaluation factors. And it looks like we found it where they're saying specific instructions, proposals, submittal instructions here. They're not calling it instruction to offers or section L. Another great example of how every bid is different. But this is where they tell you what you want. And now we've already read the valuation with all those sub factors. Now we can see, okay. Okay, section one, they want to cover letter, table of contents. They're literally telling us how to lay out this technical response. Narrative responses to the evaluation factors and sub factors, bingo, exactly what we just covered, right? So this is this is the approach. This is the process. It's not my process. It's the process that meshes with contracting's process, which is the right process. Um, past performance, one copy. I'm just curious. They want... They want three over the last five years. And then for price, complete the SF 1449 form and that pricing table. So much more involved. This is over a hundred page solicitation. 
technical past performance price, but we already have a very high level idea. And the reason we practice this is because say we spent 10 minutes on this particular bid, say we've spent 30 minutes in over this entire hour so far, actually looking at the solicitation. It's been another half an hour talking about stuff and answering questions. But the time that you're actually investing, looking at these solicitations, guys, it's valuable. It's precious. It's also like if you if you only have so much decision making ability, so much brain power in a day, or you're like carving out like what is, what is your systems? Okay, once a week I'm going to look at bids. Twice a week, every other day, right? I'm going to look at bids, or just on the weekends because I'm busy during the week. Whatever that process is, it's actually a system, whether you know it or not. And then within that system, you have so much juice, you have so much power. Now. If it's a Saturday afternoon and you spend two hours going through what we just went through only to decide you don't want to go after it, well, you've kind of used up all your juice for that afternoon. Maybe you come back to it in the evening or something. But if you can come into these solicitations, find key information, I say it's like an Easter egg hunt, which means you're not reading page by page, line by line. You're looking for specific information that will empower you to answer your own personal questions about, hey, if it's like I'm, I'm trying to convince myself to not go after this and I just can't convince myself to not do it, it looks like a good one, then then cool. Like that, that's a process that's based off of specific information. Or if it's something else of like, hey, you know, I want to go after solicitations right now that don't have big technical write-ups because maybe it's the busy season and I realize there's an opportunity cost of spending a lot of time on one proposal, you know, and it's July or it's August versus going after three where it's not as much, you know, in depth writing time. And I can sp spend that time more like getting quotes or vetting subcontractors. Right. So your strategy can, I don't want to say evolve over time. Your strategy should literally adjust throughout the year. You're, the, the government cycle is cyclical and therefore should be, in my opinion, your approach and your efforts also be cyclical, strategic to optimize whatever time of year this is in, but also what you have going on in your personal life and in your business based on how much do you have to give? How much time do you have? And like I started with, how much decision-making ability do you have? If we can get into this thing in 10 minutes and say, okay, technical, past performance and price, technical is for sub factors, um, prices, answering, this pricing table that they gave us and then past performance is three projects over the last five years. Can I do that? Do I want to do that? You know, this is best value or this is the lowest price. It's probably best value. Um, and we know it's for up to five technicians, all this stuff we learned in like really like 10 minutes. And if I were doing it on my own, it would be a lot quicker than that. But that's so much really key, helpful information. It should be really helpful information to you to make these sorts of decisions so that on that Saturday afternoon with your two and a half hours, maybe you can look at four or five, maybe even five and a half, six of these, right? And walk away feeling good about one or walk away feeling good about two rather than being exhausted after using your whole afternoon on one, right? So we're talking about no bid, you know, bid, no bid decision making and um, strategy to jump forward into right and it's and it's all about pulling these questions forward so that they don't bite you in the end loves alchemist says lately subs have not been the most reliable one company thanked me for informing me informing them of the bid and would go after it another asked for the location said they were five minutes away agreed to do the site visit only to go after the bid themselves. Like the same conversation I was mentioning. If they have a cage code, don't even bother getting a quote from them because they don't need you. Or if it's a socioeconomic program. If they have it and you have it, they don't need you. So it sounds like it's it's a it's a your approach can be improved by not putting all your cards on the table. I really like to use the example of if you were recruiting and I learned a lot from, you know, my mentor, the guy who took me under his wing 
and he was a recruiter for the for the army so he was hardcore but then he brought that into staffing which is you know my, largely my personal background and he would bring a candidate in, and the candidate had to con convince him as to why they wanted the job why because in his earlier days he had lots of candidates say they wanted the job and then when the start day of the job came they wouldn't show up he wouldn't even hear from him he would call them and they would say oh yeah sorry i took another job i already started a week ago and he's like what i literally had this job lined up for you right subs are the same exact way it's like herding cats like you can't herd cats they go all over the place they're like children subcontractors are like children candidates are like children trying to get people to do anything that you want them to do is it's it's an art form so when it comes to building your relationship with subcontractors starting out on that right foot having that first discovery call why is it a discovery call because you don't even know if you want them right don't fall prey to the whole i'm excited i want to get my bid out i just want to get some numbers Derek tells me to get at least two quotes. I'm just going to do it. And that's, if I get it, awesome. Because then if you win and then that sub backs out and then this sub is squirrely and he's, you know, not delivering on what he said he was going to do because he wasn't closed. You're going to wish you never had that contract. And that's called bad business. So during the discovery stage, which is the first one to two calls you have with the sub, it's vetting, it's asking these key questions and you'll never find yourself in a situation of them just leaving you. You can literally look them up in sam.gov, right? Look, go to sam.gov, advanced search, um, search by entity. You can search by their company name. Um, but they'll typically be honest with you because at that point, they don't think you're going to run away yet. So just ask them, do they have a cage code? Ask them, what is their experience in government contracting? Have they ever primed? Have they ever subbed? Just get the conversation going and flowing so that you can so you can get a pulse on where are they at with this thing. Like they may know nothing and you have to educate them on the opportunity that comes with federal government contracting. Or they may have been burnt sometimes and they're going to start bitching about it, right? And then they're going to be hesitant to work with you because you're just another company. They may even get you may even get hung up on, right? Or there may be someone who's, you know, trying to like think that they're too smart. And at which point in time you need to be smarter by finding out the, their information first before you give them the information on the job. Hope that makes sense. And I'm expanding on that because I think a lot of you guys can benefit from, from in, to improving your process, improving your approach to working with subs from one that's being excited about getting a quote, say, hey, we're really doing this to one that's slower, more methodical, not desperate, right? Consider this dating, right? You're not just going to like put it all out there, right? Because you're either going to scare them away or you're going to get taken advantage of. You have to control the power. You know, it's like pull versus push energy. You don't want to just be all push, 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 push because you're excited. It's got to be pull. They've got to be interested. They've got to come to you, you know? Absolutely. Research your calls before calling them. I mean, that's why I said use, use Google Maps, phone number, website, reviews, read through the reviews. You know, you may not even want to call this person, you know? Yeah. So much helpful stuff in the chat here. Absolutely. Yeah. Love Alchemist says, I received that. I'm definitely working on the approach. My biggest thing is transparency and integrity. Thousand percent. Yeah, you're, you're exactly on the right path, man. You just got to keep doing it. Um, and the fact that you receive that means that you will quickly improve by leaps and bounds as long as you keep taking that same attitude and approach to it. So I love that. Exo says, I spend my weekends pulling uh, seven contracts and working through them on the weekdays. That's great. That's what your process is. Everyone's is different. All that matters is knowing that you have a process. Uh, MMIS says, we are excited about your new book. Do you have a time frame for when it comes out? It will be before the end of the year. If you just stay uh, just stay tuned, you won't be able to miss it. Also, you have a video or some type of visual content that mirrors your book. We do have a, a course that directly mirrors the book. 
So it's a series of videos along with the resources so that you can actually start doing the, the real work um, that mirrors the book as well. So the book is the legal middleman method. The course is the legal middleman method. Yeah, Ryan says, I try to go contracts that are no more than a month out. I, I actually also teach that. So I love that. You can set the the one month. You have like one month or three months out and say I'm not gov for a live solicitations, right? Um, usually a month is a, it's, it's a good window. And then if you're at a slower time of year, you're not finding as much, you can open it up a little bit or you can open it up to pre sales You can open it up to source of sought. If you need to build out more of a pipeline. But if you're here to bid and put numbers on the board and play the numbers game, start with what's in front of you. You know, you don't need to go chasing forecasts or anything like that. Start with what you have in front of you and work your way from there. If you grow into having the, the increased demand, then certainly go for it, you know, but usually most are good within that time range. Oh, uh, hey, Christy, love. Um, last one, and then we'll go back to solicitations. Pardon me if I've already explained. What is the best method for um, including an extensive resume of a subcontractor? Not sure if I display it as my company or as my sub. So yeah, Christy, it's a good question. I don't remember if you've asked it before or not, but um, if you're legal middlemanning, you are actually like you're getting quotes from subcontractors, but when you actually come together, right? So when you actually choose a company to work with and you come together to perform on a contract, say you win an award, then, then it translates to an actual teaming relationship, right? And you have a teaming partner. So you can explain that. That's how you explain it. That's a terminology you can use as a teaming arrangement, right? Or a teaming partner where you are explaining that you will be working with uh, XYZ company as your teaming partner should that situation happen and play out, right? Um, when you're in the process of only getting quotes, right? You may have several like subcontractors. They're not all your teaming partner because you're not going to all be working with all of them. But when you actually do come together and you have an agreement, which I recommend that you have some sort of teaming um, agreement in place, that is the person you will be like working with, right? So you can explain to contracting um, from the standpoint of teaming. I hope that makes sense. And if you do find yourself in the situation where it's just one company, then um, just one company. All right, cool. Let's, uh, yeah, we got, I think we'll do one more for the interest of time and my voice, but I'm just so happy to be back on this episode. We got a lot of people on the live. I want to keep it going as much as we can. Fire alarm maintenance and repair Topeka, Kansas. VA MC, VA Medical Center. So this one's due October 26th. So like, guys, when they're this close, th these are, you know, most of these are examples anyways for you guys. Like, but these are all live, of course. But when they're this close, it's, I don't expect that you would go out and try and bid on it. It, it should go without saying. Set aside, again, it's VA, so SDVOSB. 561621 Security System Services, Topeka, Kansas. We've got three amendments. Amendment one, changing the quote due date. Amendment two, uh, Q&A. And Amendment three, Q&A. So that helps. And then for our attachments, we just have solicitation and then the three amendments to reflect that. Makes sense. We have Teresa Cabanting in Contracting. And for the history, it's been about a month of updates. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll just go ahead. Uh, I don't know. I'm actually going to take a peek at the last amendment just to see how they're doing it, guys. And when it comes to amendments, right, like this is actually an amendment. It looks like an SF-1449 form, but it is a bit different. Um, you do still have to print date and sign to formally acknowledge an amendment if they're asking for it. So now it says important contractor either is not or is required to sign this document. This is like what I'm just saying. So I'm showing you where it actually says it on the, the document. They check the box that says it is required. So you would just come down here boxes 15 A, B and C print date and sign. 
and include this as a separate attachment in your email when you submit your actual proposal. This is how you formally acknowledge amendments. And this is important and probably a good example because there's three different amendments on this. And contracting check the box. For all three of these that it needs to be um, acknowledged formally and returned. Okay, so three different and if you want to like put these together in some sort of like a uh, PDF like extractor combiner thing, you know, I recommend small PDF as a software if you don't like use Adobe, um, it's a little bit cheaper. And I think it's a little bit easier to use. In my opinion, I like it small PDF, just Google it. Uh, but yeah, whatever document management software you use will allow you to combine these if you wanted to. So yeah, before diving into the solicitation, I just wanted to sneak peek to see what those amendments were to make sure I didn't read something that was just totally outdated. And do you see, do you see the difference in the VA contracts? Like this one, especially they use this blue, their tables look <laughs> like they use the same exact word table for all of their pricing. The more VA contracts you look at, you'll see that it's very specific to them and nobody else quite does it in this exact type of layout. But again, fire alarm maintenance and repair. So when we're looking at these, It's an on, it's gonna like think of an ongoing thing, you know, testing, alarm, signal, security detection systems, preventative maintenance, testing and repairs. So they are hitting us with multiple different services. We're seeing POP to begin October 2nd, which guess what? It's October 24th. <laughs> so this is definitely something so this is due october 26th but when this was written that's what it's telling us when this is written it's supposed to start the work is supposed to start like almost four months uh, four weeks ago so this will obviously be updated and changed that's my point some of you guys freak out and say oh my god the pop it's like two days after the the due date it will likely be updated okay they could technically still hold it to you, but for something like this, where it's actually backdated, it will absolutely be pushed out. And the thing is, guys, you know, a lot of you are understandably contracting is very like black and white on, on the front end of like bidding. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to get them to respond back to you, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bit intimidating. Once you win a contract, now you're in more of a relationship with contracting where you're both aligned on. I'll say doing a good job, but meeting the needs of the requirement. Okay. Cause there's a, an, an end user, there's a, a customer within the government that's using whatever it is. In this case, if it's, if it's the fire alarm monitoring, then it's, it's the base, it's, it's the building. It's everybody inside there. That's quote unquote using it. Right. And there's going to be one or two people that are probably going to be designated as a base ops sort of person internally that would, probably serve as the core on this and provide the oversight, but it technically affects everybody. And then that ties into the mission and all those sorts of bigger, broad scale things, right? So all of that is being affected by this. But like I said, there's two different services here. They're saying uh, the service for the maintenance and then it's just some repairs, not 60, 25 K. So fair enough for a base year. Option year one, option year two, option year three, option year four. Okay, base plus four. Then we have the statement of work, which we won't go into because most of these, it's fairly intuitive and you can read it on your own. But I am going to read backwards now, which we can tell these are wage terminations. Okay, so we're seeing evaluation. That's we're getting hit with some factors and sub factors once again. I am going to keep going just to see if we are going to be hit with instruction offers. 
If not, I'll come back down to the evaluation. We have reps asserts here, so it should be somewhere in the middle. Type of contract, protest, site visit. Maybe they don't have it. I'm just going to do a control find for instruction. Same page 52. Okay, here we go. Yep. Page 52. <clears throat> So they are giving us, okay, here we go. Submission of offers, da, 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 da. Signed SF 1449 form, fill out the table. Here's what I wanted. Factor one, technical. <laughs> okay, attachment three, factor two, price. So technical price and price. So for the technical capability, offers shall submit a separate PDF document and labeled as attachment two, factor one, technical capability. See what the offer is. So they're telling you, like, you have to name it this. Like you have to name it, especially when they put in quotes, that's what the document needs to be called. Okay. State what the offer's capabilities are and the plan to execute the services in sufficient detail to evaluate compliance with the requirements. So they're looking for compliance Compliance is usually more of a pass fail type thing. Only restating the statement of work and or not submitting required documents may lead to your proposal not being uh, considered or being considered non-responsive and not considered any further. Also include any terms of express warranty um, and any product literature. So again, guys, remember when I said at the beginning of today's episode, when you're responding to the technical, you're not just saying the what, because that is literally parroting back the statement of work which is it's what they said here. Only doing that, only restating the statement of work, you'll be found not responsive. You have to explain the how. And the how, they're giving you words. They're saying, what are your capabilities and what is the plan to execute these services in sufficient detail to evaluate compliance? Now that in itself may even seem uh, vague or general, but from there, you have something to work with. You can you can break, further break down and expand on what that means. If you're working with a potential teaming partner, you can pose that to them to have them help you break it down. Or you can go to contracting and say, hey, is there any additional ways you want us to break that down? Or you just want us to tell you what the plan is and also to tell you why we are capable of doing it or why our team is capable of doing it. Because technically that's what they've said here. And then for price, I think we pretty much already know. So I, I do want to see if best value, they're saying the government will, price will be based on price reasonableness and competitive offers to determine that the prices are fair and reasonable and provide the best value. That's the only place. I'm going to try lowest price. I'm looking to see if there is, they've given us. Government reserves the right to consider a quote other than the lowest price. So it's a bit of a mix. It this, this does not scream a lowest price bid. And they're actually suggesting that the government does have the right to award to uh, a bid other than the lowest price. But that also doesn't mean that it wouldn't go to the lowest price because they're also referencing these technical capabilities, which they further break out. This would help you with your writing in the evaluation section, some factors A and B, talking about proven experience with specifically simplex alarms, and then also any trainings and certs, right? This is going to be more of a compliance piece and more of a pass fail. Like we talked about, you either have it or, or you don't. So that's why I'm saying it's not necessarily a home run for best value. It sounds like they could, if you check these boxes, these minimum criteria, they could make a case for lowest price. But you are going to have to, you know, aside from these also hit the past performance piece and then have a price that is reasonable competitive and also a proposal that's offering best value. So this one does not come out and say it. You could, you could ask contracting is it best value or is it lowest price? If I had to put my money on one, I would say to write this as a best value bid based on a few of the things that I've cited. 
Kim Pittman says, can you explain the wage termination? So wage termination is, um, it's actually from the Department of Labor, the DOL, if you actually look at it, you can actually pull wage determinations from um, SAM.gov itself by county. Um, there's wage determinations for services, and then there's wage determinations for construction. So for construction, it's Davis Bacon. For services, it's the um, McNamara Service Contract Act, SCA wage. And what the function of a wage determination is, does not tell you what you have to pay the contract workers. It just indicates the minimum amount that needs to be paid to a contract worker based on whichever occupation code is in line with whatever the scope of work is. And that's indicated on the actual wage determination itself. You'll see it's just pages and pages and pages of labor categories and description, occupation code, and then a rate. Okay. So it's just, it indicates the minimum. In addition to that, it'll talk about, you know, for, for SEA, for services, there'll be the um, two weeks vacation after one year, there'll be the paid holidays, there will be a health and welfare uh, amount as well that sh needs to be added. And then for construction, it's going to be the rate plus the fringe. And the fringe is quite substantial because it includes all of those things, right, for construction workers. So what you need to know, once again, is it's just the minimum amount of money that people need to be paid. And this is, again, from the DOL, because as you can imagine, contract workers could go and complain. And then the DOL will send a letter out to the, your company. They'll come out and uh, investigate or talk to you and say, well, hey, like, what are you paying these people? These people are saying that they're underpaid or they're saying that they're not getting the benefits that they're entitled to as a federal contract worker. Let me see what are you offering? What are you providing? So now the right way to do it is to say, well, here's the, here's the, the wage determination on my contract, right? And here's my labor category and there's the rate, right? And then maybe here's the, here's the fringe or here's any of the additional benefits, right? And what I'm paying, if you have a good answer, what I'm, you're saying what I'm paying is at least this much, if not more. And if what you're paying is less than that, the DOL is going to say, well, you've been screwing your people over. You have to write a check to all of your people for all of the compensation that they were undercompensated for based on what that minimum is. So in a nutshell, that's how wage determinations apply to you and why they exist and what they are. But again, it's not what you have to pay your people. It's not like this is what I this is what I pay them. It's just it's a minimum amount. It's just a bar. If you're at or above the bar, you're fine. It doesn't matter. It's just to protect contract workers. <clears throat> Hopefully that makes sense. Do you find it best to present a team agreement to each potential sub before bidding? This this allows potential subs to know what to expect versus yeah, I would Chrissy, I would be um in favor of that. Like more more uh, transparency with the sub the better because it you know subs get a little squirrely if you if it seems like you're adding new information in towards the end or if it appears that you're changing stuff so absolutely let them know the the, the teaming partner approach and that you're if you're doing legal middlemaning like how you're going to be managing the contract or if there is anything you're self-performing and then what the subs role will be absolutely like from from day one um i don't think there's any reason not to do that Wisdom to wealth. I, I saw this. I had to come. I just won my first contract for 189K after looking at your videos. That's so freaking awesome. Congratulations. Those are the things that like I wish I knew. Like I wish I knew the amount of businesses and lives that have been impacted by the channel. And I, I'm saying this just because literally I, I every single time we go live, I hear this. Somebody won their first contract, their second contract, or a third contract. Um, and they attribute it a lot to like this show in particular. Um, but some of the information on the channel and that's what keeps me going. I love hearing that so much wisdom to wealth. I always like to get excited, but I always say, make sure now that you won. And maybe this was in the past um, or maybe a lot of time has passed. But if this is recent, make sure everything is in line now to make sure you're able to deliver because you don't want to just win and then not have essentially um, the, the ducks in a row to execute on it. Right. We want to do a good job. If there's option years, we want to make sure we get those option years executed we want to make sure we have strong communication always with contracting in the core. Um, never just start doing work. You want to make sure you have some sort of notice to proceed or start a work meeting, like all very, very solid things. Um, and then 
do a good job and do more of that. Like cookie cutter, learn, grow. You're going to come up against obstacles. There's still going to be lessons learned, but this is really like such a huge step that you've taken with winning your first contract. Mentally, I'm sure it's just like a huge shift in your belief of what's possible because now you know you can do it and you can do it more. And it's such an exciting time. So congrats. And thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I'm, I'm so touched that um, maybe uh, the channel, maybe just in a very small way, even helped to contribute to that. April says, great content. Thank you. My software dev team is running a beta AI to streamline RFP process. That's awesome, April. I've heard a lot about that, actually. Um, there's a lot of companies, quite honestly, running to market with that. And I wish I was the tech person to, to invent it because I would have <laughs> I would be on it. But I am the furthest thing from a tech person. So I, I root you on and I, I hope that you create a, an amazing solution. Um, and then I will use it and talk about it on on the channel. Cool, guys. Awesome. JJ says, good to see you back. Uh, thank you so much. Um, how would you suggest managing a contract other than having a status report daily or calling and asking if everything is going well every day? I mean, if you if you built in travel to the contract, I mean, it is something that I recommend as you guys start bidding, as you start growing, um, if you're going to be doing stuff out of state, it doesn't hurt to at least build in like one trip per year to go and visit because it's also a biz dev type thing. It's a, it's an investment, right? If, if, if you can still be competitive in your pricing to do so, um, or if not, you could even eat a little bit of it from your profit to, to meet the core. Um, you likely wouldn't meet contracting in person, but the boots on ground person, the contracting officer's rep, subs if you're staffing certainly take your people out to launch all that good stuff um so aside from kind of like the the daily reports the weekly calls if at a even on an annual basis or even semi-annual if you could swing it um if you can get out there you will find the more you're in the game when you do talk to contracting or when you do talk to the core they will tell you man so and so had this contract before you they had it for three or four years and i never even seen them so it's really there's really an opportunity for you to to stand above the rest by just getting out there once or a little bit or a couple of times um a little bit of effort can have a big make a big you know bang or a big swing and if they have other contracts there's an opportunity to maybe discuss those look at those depending on what the scope is right um so well well worth it but i but i am just a big believer in you know, even doing like the, the daily reports and then the weekly uh, calls. I mean, that's great. That's fantastic. I mean, that's typically built in for like C drills, like contract deliverables. Once an award gets made, and usually the contract is uh, enforcing that anyways. Um, so some of this other stuff is just like if you're wanting to, I'm guessing that's what your question is coming from. Um, I know it's not sexy or any sort of crazy idea, JJ, but just the more involved you can be, you know, the better. And then, you know, I guess the country is more about managing the contract. So, yeah, if there's any sort of um, software to to streamline and to speed up efficiencies in the flow of information, um, as your company grows, you could look at maybe using some sort of HR portal thing to get that feedback uh, from your employees or if you're working with a subcontractor or something like that, to get that feedback much quicker um, again, depending on compared to what your setup looks like currently. So some things to consider. Struggleville, is it possible to see an old winning proposal? Uh, we, you know, we get that question so many times. Um, I certainly have many templates and things like that. Um, you can FOIA for previous, but they don't show you as much anymore. It's not really helpful. And the reason why is because, again, every bit is different. So the problem is a lot of people, they want to see an old winning proposal because they think, oh, if I could just see this, I could just use this and then I'll just do this to go and win my own. But it doesn't work that way. You could you could take what you got from the winning proposal and it will lose you every single bid and it'll make your company look horrible. Right. Because if you use the right things at the wrong time, it shows that you have no idea what you're doing. So I just encourage you to not um, to kind of like elevate your thinking from that. I understand the need where it's coming from because you don't know what right looks like. Right needs to be backed into 
And so it's really, it's not what anybody wants to hear, but I talk about it all the time on the channel and I bore you guys with it, but like, you gotta, you gotta walk before you start running. You gotta read before you can write and starting with a winning proposal is the exact wrong thing to do, right? You should start with reading the solicitation, extract from that what is needed, use that to build the outline. Right. And then once you have the outline, start plugging and chugging and filling in the information you have. And then the information you don't have, you go and you start getting it. Right. Rather that's from teaming partners or whatever. Right. And then you start working on your pricing. And then that's what a winning proposal looks like for that bid. And then that will be very different than the next bid that you look at. But you will eventually have some things that start to stack. That becomes what I call your company's own library of templates, your own library of proposal information that does work for you. Because again, what works for another company would not work for you. So you do the good work, you fight the good fight, you give yourself the time to do it, let the stack and build. You're going to be winning more over time because you're going to get better and you're going to become more efficient and just effective at doing it. Okay. But you just can't get around doing the hard work and it starts with reading and going from there. Hey TC, hey GovKid, long, long time no see. Absolutely. We are back. Episode number 46, right? Um, definitely good to be back. Uh, if you just joined, anybody who just joined later on, if you missed the start of the episode, uh, definitely check out the beginning of the episode. I touched on some of the new things that are coming out. I touched on uh, kind of where I've been the last few months over summer, some of the things that have gone on in my personal life, um, some challenges, and also kind of what I used some of that time uh, to take, you know, the business and what we have going on here with our platform kind of to, to the next level for you all. So definitely go back and check out the beginning of the episode once um, the live commences here, which I think we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, but yeah, go ahead and check that out on replay because we've gone for um, a little bit longer today. But you know what? It's flown by and it's been great. And there's been so much great stuff in the chat. And it's so good to see you guys. It's so good to be back. So um, same place, same time, I believe, or maybe the time will be a little bit earlier, perhaps just watch for it. Um, next week, we'll keep this, uh, we'll keep this ball rolling guys for our next episode. So thanks for watching. Um, smash the like button as always, um, subscribe to the channel if you're new here and welcome. And thanks for hanging out with us. I hope you got some value today. I tried to answer as many questions as I could. I know I couldn't get to all of them. Um, bring your questions to the next episode and I'll try to answer those then. Until next time, guys, thanks for hanging out and we will see you all on the next one. Take care.